Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Catapult's last Thinking Differently of 2022. We're going to give just a minute to allow our attendees to come into the broadcast, and then we'll get started with our discussion about mental health in the workplace. Glad to have everyone joining us today. All right, and with that, we are now uh, just a few minutes past the hour, so let's kick off our session. Um, it's my pleasure as the CEO and president of Catapult to bring you this series, Thinking Differently, um, where we get to explore a lot of different topics that are timely and important for the workplace. You've heard me say that at Catapult, um, our mission is to provide you with exceptional resources uh, so that you can um, operationalize your work and your business. And so our, our presentation today is really about fulfilling our mission to you so that you can create exceptional workplaces um, in, the, in your organizations. So with that, let me introduce um, our speaker today. Kathy Rogers is the Executive Director of Mental Health America of Central Carolinas, and she's been in that role since uh, 2017. Kathy brings more than 20 years of executive nonprofit management experience, uh, including 12 years as the Executive Director of United Way of Henry County and Martinsville, Virginia, where she was instrumental in starting an early childhood initiative a faith-based crisis network and a nonprofit capacity building initiative. Prior to joining Mental Health America, Kathy was the executive director of Piedmont Arts, a nationally accredited arts organization also in Martinsville, Virginia. Prior to coming into the nonprofit sector, she spent some time as the director of corporate communications and investor relations for a large textile manufacturer. So she has quite the broad experience between both nonprofit and corporate America. She is a member of the North Carolina Mental Health Coalition, the Mental Health America's National Affiliate Relations Committee, and Mecklenburg County's Community Wellness Task Force. She also serves on the U-City Family Zone Community of Health Committee. She's also going to talk to us about a, um, an acronym called QPR, uh, which is Question, Persuade, and Refer, which is a suicide prevention um, strategy uh, where she is also certified as a QPR um, prevention instructor. So we are delighted um, to have Kathy. Kathy and I um, have had some opportunity to work together over the last few years. Um, and she and her organization, Mental Health uh, America of the Central Carolinas, really provide a great resource for all of the Carolinas. And I'm delighted to have Kathy join us today. So Kathy, thank you for being with us. I'm gonna turn this over to you. Um, and uh, if you have questions as attendees, please feel free to put those in the question um, area. And then we'll collect all of those. And at the end of Kathy's presentation, we'll come back and talk through those. So Kathy, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I appreciate it so much. And I'm so happy to be here to talk about the important topic of mental health and well-being in the workplace. Um, we can skip over. We saw heard my bio, and I appreciate that nice introduction. Um, we do serve Mecklenburg and Cabarrus counties, but the things I'm going to talk about are, are, you know, pertinent to anyone wherever you're joining us from. And our vision really is all about eliminating the stigma that continues to surround mental health and promoting mental wellness for everyone. We do this in a lot of different ways, uh, providing help, offering hope, and promoting mental, mental wellness through advocacy, education, and prevention. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So we are, we talk about the fact that um, we ha it's easy for us to talk about our physical health, but it's it's uh, much more difficult because of stigma um, and just a lack of knowledge to talk about our mental health in an open uh, way. But we know we can't separate this head from our body. Um, we think we think about when we know someone maybe who's had a in our workplace who's had a cancer diagnosis 
um, were likely to maybe take a casserole to their house or send flowers and well wishes, you know, but we don't, we don't, we aren't as open about uh, how we treat mental health. And that's some of the conversation we'll have today. So again, to have a happy human, uh, we need to have a healthy body and a healthy mind. So we need to focus on all of it uh, to be happy, not only in the workplace, but in life in general. So our first poll question that we have today is, when you think of the term mental health, do you have a positive reaction, a negative reaction, or just feel neutral? So we'll take a moment. Thank you. <clears throat> Looks like we have about 85% of our uh, responses in, so let's see what the results say. Oh, well, it's great to see uh, so many, 30%, um, showing a positive reaction and only 9% a negative reaction. Uh, it's interesting that uh, people are neutral on this. Um, let's go to the next slide and just kind of explore this just a little bit. So often when we ask this question of people, we get, um, people automatically go to maybe a diagnosis, depression, anxiety, uh, bipolar disorder, suicide, um, and what we want people to think about is, you know, maybe not being neutral about it, but being um, positive in thinking about mental wellness versus uh, mental illness. So focusing on how we take care of our mental health, um, just as we would um, going to the gym at the end of the day or grabbing a, a walk at lunch, um, how we eat, um, and sleep, of course, all of these things affect our mental health as well. So the only reason that we we post that question is to kind of get a sense of, of where people are in their thoughts when they're thinking about mental health. So let's let's move on to the next slide. We know that one in five adults um, experience a mental illness at some point in their lifetime. Often, uh, it doesn't manifest itself until the age of 14, and it can take a number of years before someone gets a, a diagnosis or the correct diagnosis. And nearly one in 25 adults in America live with a serious mental illness. Maybe it's a bipolar disorder, a severe depression, um, schizophrenia. So this just shows that I'm not sure how many we have on the call, but another of us could look to into the room if we were in a room and see someone who perhaps is experiencing mental illness. And this could be the person who's on that Zoom call with you or in the office next to you. Um, we have a, a volunteer storyteller, his name's Jim Love, and he's now a QPR suicide prevention instructor. But he did a, an interview with a, the local station WSOC, and after that interview, he had a number of individuals who he worked with reaching out to him to talk about their own mental health struggles that they had had. So it gave people permission to talk about it and to share what they were going through with Jim, at, which was what he was going through um, as well when he was in the workplace. So I just recently, today actually, um, saw a Gallup poll that showed that nearly one-fifth of U.S. workers, 
rate their mental health as fair or poor. And these workers um, report about four times more unplanned absences uh, than their counterparts who report that they have good or very good um, mental health. Um, over a 12 month period, workers with fair or poor mental health are estimated to have 12 days of unplanned unplan absences, which is compared to two and a half days for those who are experiencing better mental health. Um, you all know the toll that this can take on productivity and costs. Um, it's estimated that a missed work day is conservatively um, $340 per day for a full-time worker and $170 a day for a part-time worker. Um, the, the findings on the slide that's in front of you come from our affiliate Mental Health American National um, that reported that four in five workers report that workplace stress affects their relationships with friends, family, and coworkers. Four in five are experiencing uh, feeling emotionally drained, uh, which can be an early sign of burnout. And we know a lot of folks post-pandemic, during the pandemic, are experiencing uh, burnout in the workplace. And one in five are experiencing more severe signs of burnout, which can include chronic workplace stress. All of this affects uh, productivity, absenteeism, um, so I wanted to kind of jump into a recent report from the U.S. Surgeon General who uh, issued a white paper, a framework for mental health and well-being. And after this, you'll get a copy of this white paper. You'll get a copy of MHA National's latest workplace toolkit um, so that you'll have these resources after today's presentation. But all of these five areas um, focus on uh, different areas of mental health that is essential in the workplace. And also each of these has two essential things that we as human beings need um, to feel a sense of mental health and well-being. So let's go through these um, each one uh, at a time. So the first is protection from harm. And what we uh, talk about when we're feeling, talking about uh, protection from harm and what human beings need um, is a feeling of safety and security. Um, the four areas, prioritizing workplace physical and psychological safety. I know that we all, um, have our OSHA requirements and things uh, to make the workplace safe and healthy for our, our workers. Um, but when we talk about feeling psychologically safe, uh, this is a sense of employees feeling like they can speak up if they see something in the workplace without feeling re retaliation. Um, also, allowing workers to have adequate rest, whether it's um, when people have insufficient rest, uh, lack of sleep, uh, it can lead to stress and health conditions that impact uh, worker mental health, but also can lead to more accidents and a less, less safe work environment. When we normalize mental health uh, in the workplace, we decrease stigma, and stigma is one of the things that keeps people from seeking help when they need it. So normalizing and talking about mental health, it really does uh, work to validate people's challenges that they're having, um, communicating, communicating about mental health and well-being as priorities in your workplace, and offering supportive and prevention services. Um, again, I know that all of us don't come to um, our work with the same resources and access to services, um, but we can be creative in how we promote mental health and well being in our workplace without having a large price tag attached to it. And we'll talk about some of those. Also, a lot of us are. Um, back to the previous slide real quickly, we, um, we need to oper operationalize um, DEI and A norms 
and putting uh, relevant policies and procedures in place. We know here at MHA that structural racism, microaggressions, and impl implicit bias have an impact on our employees of color um, each and every day. And often we don't recognize um, the stress and uh, anxiety that that's placing on certain employees in the workplace. So the second essential is connection and community. Um, you know, during the pandemic, uh, when we first started talking about the pandemic, we talked about social distancing. And here at MHA, we really uh, wish that we had used the term physical distancing because it there are still ways to stay connected and create community even when we're in a remote work environment. And we need to be very intentional about doing that as an employer. Um, as human beings, we need social support and belonging, uh, both in our life uh, outside of work, but especially in the workplace as well. We can, as leaders, can cultivate uh, environments and cultures where connection is included, encouraged, and workers of all backgrounds feel included in the workplace. Um, building trust and better understanding one another as people, not just skills. So when we do a check-in with an employee, it should always start with, you know, the, some of the personal things. How are you doing? Uh, what did you do this weekend? Um, you know, talking about those things that we used to do around the water cooler, but maybe a little bit more difficult in whatever work environment we're in right now. Um, it's those small everyday interactions that can really help people feel connected uh, and a sense of a community. And finally, if we are continuing to work remotely in hybrid, which I know that is what we're doing here at MHA, we need to be uh, intentional about fostering collaboration and teamwork. And this is, uh, we should be doing this anyway to be successful as an organization. You know, regularly and communicating with your team, the importance of teamwork, encouraging regular communication, and even um, including time for some non-work connection. Maybe it's uh, uh, going as a group or a department or an organization to do some community service together. These things can greatly enhance a connection. If you're a nonprofit and you're working with a board, maybe it's something that your staff and board can do together uh, to improve that connection uh, within your organization. So the third essential is that work-life harmony, which I'm, and the two human needs that in, individuals need is autonomy and flexibility. And I know this isn't always easy to provide within the workspace, but um, we've seen that there are benefits in remote or a hybrid environment, uh, such as people do feel like they have a little bit more flexibility. Um, but we also feel that there have been some negative impacts of work-life boundaries. Um, you know, it's often hard uh, when you're working in your kitchen, which is where I am when I'm uh, working from home, and and turning that off at the end of the day, end of the day. We still need to have that um, that work-life balance and separate the two, even if we are working from home. Um, one thing that I would say about increased access to paid leave, the U.S. remains the only advanced economy that doesn't require medical and family leave be provided to its workforce. I know we've all been uh, reading about the railway workers and the, the um, strike that was averted recently, but the fact that they're fighting for seven days of, of sick time, um, you know, in, in a country as, as uh, developed as ours is, you know, I think it's really sad that we're not providing that. But when leaders respect and model clear boundaries between time off and off, time on and off the job, there's a greater sense of well-being among their employees. So the next slide we're going to talk about mattering at work um, and the essentials that human beings need in this area are dignity and meaning. You know, am I feeling valued when I come into work? Do I feel like I am part of a greater mission? 
uh, how are we connecting individuals who are working with us to the overall mission of our organization? Are we providing a living wage? We know that when employees are um, worried about you know, finances and paying the bills, uh, their mind may not be where it should be when they're, when they're at work. Um, can we engage workers in workplace decisions, whether it's through uh, utilizing engagement surveys or adding measures to dashboards and other tools that measure well-being? Um, we've recently um, started using Bamboo HR here at MHA, and there's some great uh, pulse tools just to take the pulse of your organization at a point in time. and to give you a sense of what you need to be working on uh, with regards to pe people's feeling valued at work. Um, and how do we build a gratitude, a culture of gratitude and recognition? We all know those surveys that tell us that um, while people do need to make a living wage, there's just as much value in people feeling appreciated um, and, and that their work is being recognized um, by leaders in the organization. So the final um, essential that the uh, U.S. Surgeon General put out in his um, uh, framework for mental health well-being is opportunity for growth. And um, can you provide trainings, education, or mentoring for employees to make them feel like they have some opportunities to grow, whether in the job that they're in or are there opportunities to move up? How can we foster clear pathways for career advancement for employees? Um, and how can we equip leaders to make sure that they're providing employees with relevant uh, feedback that makes it clear to employees what they need to be doing to be successful in the organization. So I know I kind of went through those um, pretty quickly, but uh, we will have time for further discussion. So if we can move on to the next slide. So another uh, poll question. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about self-care, whether it's work or at home, but our question is, do you practice self-care at work? All right, looks like we've got uh, good responses in. Let's see the results. Okay, so 29% are very intentional about um, putting self-care as part of their regular work routine, which I think is great. 51% um, get try to do it, but maybe aren't as success, successful every day. And 21% don't think about self-care at work. And so thank you for those, um, your responses on that. Let's talk a little bit about um, self-care. So there are a lot of things we can do. Uh, and again, I don't know what each and every one of you have on your to-do list or your employees have, but um, is there a way that you can balance your caseload or your work so that there's not one part of the day where it's too much? Um, maybe, um, you know, spending little chunks of time. I like doing those things that I can get out of the way. That's probably a psychological thing where we want to uh, do the easy things first. Um, arranging your workspace so it's comfortable um, and comforting to you, um, whether that's having some pictures from home or uh, there comes a point in time for me when my desk is like my brain probably is at that time and I need to clean it up and organize it uh, for my own mental health and wellness. Um, getting regular supervision, you know, on uh, can help you with your mental wellness at work, making sure that you're on task, that you're 
um, getting those things done that are expected of you. Can you negotiate for your needs? Um, maybe I need that 15 minute break um, every couple of hours. Um, peer support group here, at, we haven't done it, but can we um, think about creating affinity groups within our uh, organizations or, or just having those informal supports that can help us um, with our mental wellness? It is so important that we um, set boundaries. Um, I am a person that tries to model for my employees that when I leave work, I've left work at work. Um, you Trying to um, get support from college, colleagues. One thing we've started implementing here at MHA at the end of our fiscal year is um, two mental health days, closing, I know, again, I know this isn't possible for everyone, but closing the office for two days, giving people plenty of notice that they can clear their calendars just to take two days off to focus on their mental health. So let's go on to the next slide. I, I was curious because um, there are some specific things related to uh, remote work, um, that can help us uh, with our with our mental health and self care. So I was curious to see, uh, you know, where you are in your uh, work environment. Are you in person, remote, working a hybrid model? All right, looks like we've got our results in. Okay, wow, okay. We have a lot of people working remotely or, or in a hybrid model and quite a few who are 100% in person. Um, so let's move on and, and think about those who are working hybridly or remotely. Um, one thing that we know that there have been working from home challenges, uh, loneliness and isolation. Uh, we struggle with this every day in our own organization. You know, disconnectivity from coworkers and the rest of the world can make us feel lonely and isolated. Um, and this is associated with higher rates of depression and anxiety. Um, how do we as employers find ways to promote connectedness, uh, whether it's a, a game lunch hour, virtual game lunch break where we play family feud or something on, on our lunch break with other employees. Uh, the, as I mentioned before, when we have that boundary between work and home life blurred, uh, it can, that can create anxiety and stress and pressure. We never feel like we can turn work off or, or kind of leave work as effectively as we could when we were going into the office. Um, work from home depression can happen when you feel stuck. Uh, sometimes when we're working from home, uh, you know, without a career milestone, like a new nameplate on your desk or a corner office, you may not feel as if you're achieving as much as your peers. Um, so let's talk about a few things that we can do to take care of ourselves in a remote or hybrid work environment. So creating a routine and sticking to a schedule. This is good for whether we're in the office or working remotely, but when we organize our task, outline our goals, we're able to mentally prepare ourselves for what to expect during the day. Um, I'm a big, you know, I have my calendar on my computer, but I also have that written to-do list because there's some sort of satisfaction in physically crossing something off that list. So it's easier to work towards achieving the goals that we set out rather than, you know, kind of vaguely meandering throughout the day when we're very, have that routine and stick to a schedule. You know, get up and move when we're at home. It's important, and I would say this is important for if you're in the office. Um, 
when I was working in the office by myself, I had my yoga mat, my waves. I would even take a dance break sometimes just because no one was around to see me. And when you're working from home, typically other than your dog, your furry, um, furry uh, children that you have, there's no one there to see you. So, uh, you know, getting up, taking a dance break, going for a quick walk, um, especially if the weather's nice. Um, you know, exercise has over and over again been proven to help reduce anxiety. And it doesn't have to be an hour at the gym. You can take these mini breaks. Um, I have a coworker, um, I'll say, oh, I've got a headache. And he'll say, have you hydrated? Have you been drinking water? And I'll, you know, realize, no, I haven't. So kind of watching out for each other, even when we're um, talking to people remotely. Um, and that's a good thing. Make time for your favorite people. Support from your peers is just as effective as cognitive behavior therapy when you're feeling down. Um, so carve out some time each week to spend with a core group of friends and family members who lift you up, don't bring you down. Um, going back to self-care, you know, it's really important that when we have vacation, that we take our vacation, you know, that we don't leave that. I never leave days, none taken in a year, um, even if I have to pay for it when I come back. Um, so those are a few things that, to think about if you're working remotely, but can also very much apply to when you're in the office as well. So I love this quote, an em empty lantern provides no light. Self-care is the fuel that allows your light to shine brightly. Uh, one thing that we always say here at MHA is self-care is not selfish. And the other thing that we talk about is if you've uh, been on a plane uh, anytime, uh, the, they always tell you to put that oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on someone else if you have a child with you. Um, because if we don't take care of ourselves, if we, um, we will burn out and we won't be able to um, take care of those around, what, those around us. We won't be able to effectively do our jobs. And so it really is important to think about our mental health and well-being, not only for ourselves, but those we are leading uh, within our organizations. The next uh, slide, and you're going to get this uh, after the, this uh, webinar, so you have it. Work-life balance is so important, and there's so many ways we can take care of ourselves, whether it's physically, uh, psychologically, our emotional needs, spiritually. Um, there's so much spirituality that within mental health and mental wellness. Uh, whether it's, again, volunteering for a cause or, um, you know, meditating, again, singing, dancing, uh, playing, you know, that's something that we forget about as we grow up. We need to take time to play. Um, I know if you're like me, being by the ocean is so healing by water. And, and it's been shown that being by water uh, can help our mental health. But also thinking about our, our personal lives. Um, what is our life plan? What are our short, mid, long-term goals? Are we fostering our friendships and our relationships? Um, if you're married or have a partner, do you go on dates still? Um, so finding ways to, to spend time with family and friends is so important for our mental health. Um, professionally, again, Take time for lunch. Um, even if you're eating at your desk, take time to maybe uh, write in your journal. Uh, journaling, especially a gratitude journal, has been shown to be so good for our mental health. When we have a mindset of gratitude each day as we get up, it helps our mental health so much. Um, again, leave work at work. I know that's hard to do always when we've got deadlines. Um, if you're a nonprofit, you might have an event or a grant that's due, um, but it, whatever you do, there are those days when you, you can't um, leave work at work. But, but if we can try to do these things, um, on the emotional side, uh, it talks about affirmations. My um, stepdaughter, you know, whenever she 
changes her or gets her little one uh, dressed for bed, she always gives him his affirmation so that he knows how wonderful he is. So um, the next slide does uh, share a tool that we have on our website. And this is from our national affiliate. Wherever you are in the state, um, you can access these online mental health screening tools. Um, often we don't know what the signs and symptoms of our particular uh, mental health diagnosis, whether it's depression, anxiety, or maybe we're concerned about a, a child in our life. There is a test that you can take, uh, a youth mental health screening you can take. Um, but if you go to our website, which I'll share at the end, um, you'll find these under our resource page. Um, we also have emotional toolboxes for real, uh, building resilient communities, which can take you quickly to resources that may fit your need, including a workplace toolbox that can provide you with some tools uh, for your workplace. Um, again, after this, you'll get those white papers from the US Surgeon General, from Mental Health America National's Workplace Toolkit, uh, such a wealth of resources in that toolkit uh, that we love to be able to share with anyone out there who's uh, interested in promoting mental health and well-being in the workplace. So I want to thank you so much for um, allowing me to spend a little bit of time with you today. And I guess I'll turn it over to you, Cheryl, and um, we'll finish up with any questions or hopefully I can answer. If I can't, I will get the answer for you. That's been great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, this has been wonderful. I think um, just the, the thoughtfulness and the diligence to which um, you're reminding us to take care of ourselves. Um, we live in a very, very fast paced world and it's very easy to get caught up in the I got to do's. And um, I think what you've shown us today is what we've got to do as well um, in terms of taking care of ourselves. Um, you know, and one of the questions that uh, came in here is uh, from somebody who said, you know, this is great and my employer is pretty good about this, but how can I be a better resource? How can I help my employer establish some mental health services within mm -hmm. their company? Do you have some recommendations for that? So one thing I didn't mention um if you do have mental health resources like an EAP, uh, which a lot of us do have, um, a lot of times, and it came out even in this Gallup poll that I, I saw today, is that a lot of people don't even know what mental health support services their employer does have. So it's important to remind employees uh, what you do provide. Um, it's also you know, thinking about uh, our budgets, we all have a budget, we all can only spend so much. You, being creative, maybe it's um, encouraging employees to share their own ideas about p boosting mental well being. How um, we have a um, committee here on staff who plans those in employee engagement things like we have done. Um, game nights, uh, but I mentioned game lunch because people probably don't want to get on, <laughs> but they're virtual. It's ways for us to get together virtually. Um, how can we provide, um, how can we recognize employees for their well being achievements? You know, making again, talking about mental health is the biggest thing that we can do to show employees that we care about it. Um, Jim Love that I mentioned earlier, he is a suicide attempt survivor. And he did that interview on WSOC and he, one of the people that reached out to him was in the office next to his and told Jim there were days when he had his door closed and was up under his desk. I mean, we, any of us can open the door to having a conversation about mental health and breaking stigma. And we know that there are people right next door to us or in our departments or in our work 
who are struggling, but um, oftentimes feel afraid of some sort of retaliation or discrimination if they share their mental health diagnosis. So what we can all do is have those conversations. Maybe um, Cheryl mentioned QPR, which stands for Question, Persuade, Refer. It is a two hour, we can do it in less than two hours, suicide prevention training. So maybe recommending that to your employer, hey, I think this would be a great tool for at least all supervisors to have so they can recognize when um, there is someone really struggling who may be in crisis and helping with in a compassionate and caring way. Yeah, um, I think the great thing uh, that all of the attendees will get at the end of this is your contact information. Mm -hmm. um, there at MHA because it's just, you know, a small little thing can make a big difference. And right. like you said, having a conversation with people and just asking how they're doing um, is, you know, one way to open the door with that QPR. Um, exactly. For our, uh, our Catapult uh, members here, uh, we use at Catapult my group um, as our EAP. And we, we as well, yes. Located uh, out of Charlotte. And we've also recently added a new benefit for our employees um, for six hours of nutritional counseling. Um, it's now through a group called Husk Nutrition, it was formerly called Charge. Um, and, you know, you, you, oftentimes you don't necessarily think about nutrition being a component of mental health, but it is when you go back yes. to the wheel that you had there, um, you know, the physical being is, is equally as important as the psychological being to fuel your body and your mind uh, collectively. And, and, you know, the other thing, when we provide um, our employees with these opportunities outside of the day to day, it shows employees that you care about the whole person, that you, you're you trying to find ways to make them healthier, both physically and mentally. Um, another idea, because a lot of employees do struggle with their finances, is maybe to offer some financial management classes for employees. These are things that can help alleviate uh, certain stressors within their life. Um, those things outside of your to-do list that is so tied to the productivity of your organization. Um, you mentioned EAP. We actually have our annual benefits um, meeting tomorrow, but we actually have our EAP rep come on a couple of times a year just to go over the benefits because we all forget, you know, what our EAP provides. So again, being intentional about letting employees know what you do provide, because you want to get some credit for that and you also want, you know, folks to use it. I think you also gave some great tips. Um, I wrote down as you were talking, Kathy, um, mm -hmm. just the little things that you can do uh, as an individual contributor in mm -hmm. your organization or as a leader um, or as a, an HR executive in your organization. Um, one of the things that you said was modeling the way, um, right, and taking time for yourself and then modeling that for others and, and spacing out your vacations so that you don't lose yeah. it at the end of the year um we've we've seen some people too i've started now um even if i'm still working delay sending emails using that yes. lovely delay send feature so that um, i don't inundate people when they're on vacation uh or you know on a weekend and things like that um so being mindful of giving employees that space and grace uh to recharge yeah. when they need it I haven't seen that delay feature. I'm a, I need to look at that because I think that is a great idea because you want to send an email out and I'm the same. I don't want to bother this person who I know is on vacation, but I know I'm going to forget if I don't send that out. So timing that to come after. Um, I also have a board member who has in his signature about, you know, because he sends emails after work hours, does it mean that you have to respond? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I think that's a hard thing for us that um, yes. particularly in positions where you're constantly uh, moving. So it, it's been good reminder, I think, for for many of us here. Um, I want to come to that, the the um, Olga self-care wheel, because um, yes. I thought that was really um, important. And maybe I can ask our events team to put that slide back up. It's about three or four 
uh, in the presentation uh, backwards. Um, it, it reminded me uh, when I was in graduate school, there was a, uh, we had to do this balanced wheel um, mm -hmm. exercise and it was similar to this, but you had to put things that were important to you in the, the categories. So, you know, your faith in one, your work in mm -hmm. another, your family in another exercise in another, and, you know, kind of friends fill out the wheel. And, and the, the message behind that was um, if you parse out everything part, kind of equally, right. You, as you have here, six great, um, you know, spaces on the wheel um, here. If one of those goes flat, you don't have a flat tire. But if the right. whole wheel is just one or two things, you can imagine, you know, not having personal in there. If personal is taking up half of it and all of a sudden something happens in your personal life, you're at more risk by not having this balance. Do you want to exactly talk right. a little bit more about this self-care wheel in that context? Right. So we, again, it's having that life balance and, and life has so many facets to it. Um, again, I mentioned um, journaling is such a, has shown to uh, have such a psychological impact on people. Um, so, and having that gratitude mindset. So if we focus on our psychological aspect of our lives, um, what are our emotional, what are we doing for our emotions? Um, uh, do we have a pet, a fur baby, or um, again, those those self affirmations of, of, of my youngest daughter herself struggles with anxiety and depression. She's one of those that has the post-its, you know, all over the mirror when she gets up in the morning, um, you know, Crying is on this wheel. And I think sometimes that crying can be just as important as laughing. If we're, if we're grieving about something or, or feeling a certain way, letting ourselves experience those emotions. Um, I think that this focusing, again, that one of those very first slides that we can't separate this head from this body, focusing on our physical health as much as we do our me mental health helps both. You know, do we, um, there are things on here like getting a massage, um, but we try to stress that self-care doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, on here is also a bubble bath. So, you know, that doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, taking a walk, uh, develop, when's the last time that you guys developed a playlist? That you that can help you lift your spirits uh, when you need that. Um, again, the nutrition classes, being eating healthy is so important. Um, sleep is so important. I have the worst sleep habits in the world. I hate to say it, but um, getting that right amount of sleep um, can be so helpful to our mental health. So. Uh, again, this wheel is, and you'll get this uh, in your email, it's just all about really being intentional about all those facets of our life that make us a whole person, um, because we can't sacrifice one uh, without something else um, suffering for yeah. it. Uh, we have a couple other questions that have come in, um, and we are going to send this presentation out, so you'll get Kathy's um, contact information. But Kathy, help us. Um, are there best uh, places to look up resources to present to uh, their company? Uh, we have a company who's new to kind of EAP and mm -hmm. mental health awareness. Um, they want to know best practices. I know MHA does some free workshops for mm -hmm. employers. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, we do. Again, we provide uh, QPR, suicide prevention training, which is really all about um, recognizing not necessarily that in, someone has to be suicidal, but they may be in crisis and need. It teaches you how to ask the right questions, um, how to persuade someone to get help and then refer them to help. Um, we do these virtually uh, and in person now. Uh, we teach mental health first aid, which is an evidence-based training, but it's a little bit of a heavier lift because it's all day. Um, 
it teaches you the signs and symptoms of various mental health diagnoses. Um, you know, I would say from a best practices standpoint, the, the workplace toolkit will give you a lot of great information about um, how do we help um, improve the emotional intelligence of our supervisors so that they're able to get feedback in a in a emotionally healthy way. Um, different things that we can do to hold, even as an organization, steps to take to hold a mental health wellness fair at your organization um, to promote mental health. Um, there's just a wealth of resources in that document. Um, also, you know, I would bring the website up, or if, if anybody wanted uh, to, uh, there are a wealth of resources there. If we had time, Cheryl, to kind of show you what's on there. Yeah, why don't you give us, um, I'll ask our events team to maybe pull that up in the background. The <clears throat> uh, link is, and we can put it in the chat, uh, www.mhaof cc.org that's right uh -huh. and um i'm gonna see if i can put this <clears throat> out to the group and uh send that to all so you can see that hopefully that went out to uh all of our team. Uh, it is on the last page here of mm -hmm. the um, document and so you can um, go there and uh, Kathy's team I believe you also do some lunch and learns right? We do. Um, <clears throat> we do what are called coffee and conversations on a regular basis and these are all about normalizing the conversation about around mental health. Um, if you'll scroll down on the website, though, I just wanted to show these toolboxes. Keep scrolling a little bit. Right there. Um, one, we just redid our website. We got a um, nice uh, hometown grant from Vanguard. And we know how difficult it is to navigate the mental health system. So you'll see there is one for a business owner or manager. We have one for faith leaders because we know a lot of congregations are going to their pastor for help. Individuals, uh, we're doing more outreach into the Latino Hispanic community. We have a bilingual mental health educator now, um, LGBTQI plus. Parent and caregiver, if you're a parent or caregiver um, and you need help for your child, you can click on this toolbox, person of color and these toolboxes. But under the resources tab, um, there are resource, the mental health screening test, if you wanna click on that. Um, these are from our national affiliate. There are 10 questions and often we don't know how to start a conversation maybe with our primary care physician or someone in our life when we're concerned that maybe we're experiencing depression or anxiety, um, uh, PTSD, uh, there's an eating disorder test. Um, these are very easy. If you click on one, you can see, but you can print the results out. It's gonna give you some recommendations based on your score. This is not meant to be a diagnosis. It is um, more giving you information that you can take to the next step. Also on our resources page, if you wanna go back up, if you are in the um, our provider directory, oh, you know, gotta go back up to the main. Yeah, sorry. Or do the... You're doing a great job navigating on the fly. Yes, there is a provider directory on there that you can, um, I don't think on this page it'll take you back unless you do the back arrow maybe to um there is a provider directory that you can look up um, provide we know it's difficult to find a therapist uh, if you do need one you can search this one by insurance so maybe you have united health care um, so you can click on the insurance accepted and it'll show um you can click on the different insurances provided. 
um, you can search it by diagnosis. So perhaps you're, you do know that it's depression or an eating disorder, whatever the diagnosis, it'll show you the clinicians who serve those. These are primarily in Mecklenburg and Cabarrus County, unfortunately. But if you are looking for a therapist anywhere in the country, you can go to the American Psychological Association and they have a directory of um, certified licensed therapists throughout the country. And Kathy, that was a great segue because we had a question that came in that said, can people outside of the Carolinas use these toolboxes? And it's clear it's on your website, but um, MHA of Central Carolinas uh, serves the Carolinas, but you're also part of a broader national network, yes. correct? The, the screening tools are from our national affiliate. They are nationally, um, they've been researched and evidence-based. Um, the emotional toolboxes, when you click on those, it'll show you what our resources are, which primarily serve Mecklenburg and Cabarrus, but there are also regional and national resources on there for anybody who's looking for some help uh, with a particular issue, whether it's a, a an employer or a parent caregiver, uh, we know that there, if there's anything going on with our children and we don't get help for that, that's going to impact our uh, productivity, can impact absenteeism as well. So um, any of those tools also can be helpful for employers. Excellent. I'm going to give our events team one quick second to get back to our presentation. Sorry, I veered us off. The <laughs> no, no, that was great. That was a real-time um, uh, adaptation on the fly, and, and we appreciate uh, Myla and all of her work behind the scenes to get that up because I think that was a great resource to show uh, for the folks that were asking those questions. Um, Kathy, this has been fantastic. Um, the, the website is listed here. It's in the uh, chat for our group. You will all get a copy of a PDF copy of this presentation, um, along with all of the information uh, about the webinar being pre-approved for both HRCI and SHRM credits. So uh, be on the lookout for that information in your inboxes within the next 48 hours. Um, Kathy, thank you. This has been, I think, a wonderful way as we head into the holiday season to be mindful of um, celebrating and, and being full of gratitude for the people that we work with and the people that we um, socialize with both in and outside of work. So really appreciate your, your presentation today. Um, for those of you uh, out there who are not Catapult members, we invite you to join the Catapult community. Uh, many more educational resources like this one today uh, where we can help you and your organizations uh, focus on your most valued asset, and that's your people. So uh, stay tuned for uh, more information in 2023 about our Continued Thinking Differently series. Uh, we'll kick off after the new year. We wish everyone on this call a very safe and a very healthy holiday season. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it.